back to Shannon's Club TV, the program for all motoring enthusiasts to relive classic Australian road and race memories. In each episode, we profile a different feature car, find out what made it stand out in Australia and take a road trip in an owner's example. You'll also get some valuable market advice from the Shannon's auction team. Right now though, the car that defined a new niche where a sporty coupe could work as an everyday car, the Toyota Celica. The arrival of the first Toyota Celica on Australian roads late in 1971 was unprecedented. There was no direct connection with a cheaper sedan, its styling was ahead of the trend and it wasn't an obvious copy of any Western model. For just over $3,000, the exotic looks and sporty cabin were just the start. Even its high cam Hemi head 1.6 litre 2T engine and standard 5 speed manual transmission were not exactly common at this price in 1971. A twin throat carburetor then allowed it to match a 2 litre in performance with the economy of a 1.2 litre model on the highway. Although Australians had been introduced to the Ford Capri and Holden Tirana GDR just two years earlier, the pillarless Celica Coupe had extra style and refinement. And as a Toyota, it could replace a Corolla as everyday transport. It was also perfectly timed for the global oil shocks that followed its release. Mark, even if the Celica's hotter twin cam engines were not offered in Australia for fear of creating insurance problems, the Celica still gained a fairly high profile on local racetracks. How did that happen? Well, even though the, the twin cam Celica wasn't sold in Australia, it did meet FIA Group 1 homologation rules, which demanded a minimum of 5,000 identical units being built and sold, which it, it obviously met. And in the under two litre class here, the dominant cars was the Alpha 2000 GTV, and the Ford Escort RS2000, and boy, when this Celica arrived, this twin cam, didn't it shake things up? But it didn't matter that you couldn't buy one. The Celica's secret was a body much smaller and lighter than obvious rivals, but it didn't look it. Built on a short wheelbase and weighing only 970 kilograms, it was closer to a Corolla in several areas, yet was competing with coupes based on sedans from the next size up. The tight rear seat was the only giveaway. After a dream run between 1971 and 1976 with few changes, the Celica hit turbulence later in 1976 with Australia's first major emissions requirements. It never fully recovered as a car, but a steady flow of loyal and less fickle buyers meant it was no less successful. A heavier, almost tractor-like two-litre single overhead cam emissions engine was shared across the local Corona, High Ace Van and the Celica Rangers. Overnight, the Celica went from a freewheeling fun drive to a high ace van in party dress. Despite ongoing body changes and mechanical upgrades, the Celica never could quite throw its new reputation as a hairdresser's car. Sales remained strong even after enthusiasts shopped elsewhere, as Toyota still refused to offer the inspiring twin cam models. The second generation swoopy Californian looks, penned by a former General Motors designer, ensured instant success in Australia. Even the razor-edged wedge that followed sold well. As the Celica grew in size with a weight gain of at least 100 kilograms with each body change, it became a victim of middle-aged spread. It was little more than a Corona with a fancy coupe body. The extra weight, gruffness and performance of the final rear-drive Celica with its 2.4-litre version of the old emissions engine highlighted how much the rest had slipped. Before the Celica badge was totally discredited, a new front drive model took its place in 1985. It marked the end of what was an exciting rear drive sports tradition, curtailed in Australia for fear of inviting prohibitive premiums from the powerful local insurance industry. Mark, Celica involvement in Australian motorsport seemed to increase in direct proportion to its decline as a road car. Yeah, and that was very important in terms of protecting the Celica's you know, image and reputation for road car buyers. Stay with us as we meet a proud Toyota Celica enthusiast and we get the latest news from the Shannon's auction team in Hammer Time. Motorsport success has played a key role in changing public perceptions of many car makes and models over the years. And one of the best examples of this was the Toyota Celica when it competed in Australian touring car racing in the late 1970s and early 80s. In 1977, Sydney Toyota dealer Peter Williamson became the first driver to enter the Japanese coupe in the Bathurst 1000, much to the surprise and it must be said amusement 
of many class competitors and motoring riders who dismissed it as little more than a curiosity. As Joe mentioned, back then the Celica was largely dismissed by hard-edged Aussie male enthusiasts who saw the little Japanese coupe as being designed mainly for female buyers more interested in perfume than performance. What they didn't know was that Williamson had gained approval to race the 2.0-litre twin-cam RA23 GT model that was not sold in Australia, offering a stunning level of performance which would change public perceptions of the Celica virtually overnight. Joe, given the amazing performance of Williamson's twin-cam Celica GTs during this time, you know, particularly at Bathurst, it must have been a source of constant frustration for local buyers that they couldn't buy the same car in local showrooms. I think this point in Toyota history mm. was where Toyota became the appliance company, yeah. the white goods company. I don't think they got away with it. People could see these wonderful Celicas on the track and this is what you can buy. And the, and the disconnect was too great. And I think um, Australian buyers became, they sort of boxed Toyota as some, something not relevant to, to an enthusiast. Mm. And I don't, think, I don't think they fully recovered from that. Yeah, it's been a long, hard struggle. Pre-race scepticism about Williamson's Celica debut at Bathurst in 1977 was immediately erased after he set a qualifying time a staggering 1.3 seconds faster than his two-litre opposition. Although niggling new car problems in the race spoiled the fairy tale, Williamson took pole position again in 1978. He was also well in contention for his first class win that year until his Celica was rammed in the tail by another competitor causing frantic, axe-wielding scenes on live TV as his pit crew tried desperately to open the damaged boot lid to refuel the car. In 1979, Willow and his new RA40 Celica GT were destined to raise their TV profile to new heights when he became the first driver to carry the Seven Network's new race cam onboard camera during the Bathurst 1000. This put enthralled TV viewers inside a Bathurst race car for the first time, as Williamson and co-driver Mike Quinn drove the Celica to its first class win. During the next two years at Bathurst, Willow's twin cam Celica GTs would claim another class win and continue to amaze TV viewers with race cam, providing entertaining chat as he reached astonishing speeds across the top of the mountain that often embarrassed much bigger cars. The Group C Bathurst Celica era ended in 1982, when a pre-race crash left Williamson without a car and a reshuffle of the classes rendered the remaining two-litre cars uncompetitive. Even so, those six years of mountain magic completely changed public perceptions of the Toyota Celica, a car which even today is fondly remembered by race fans as a giant killer that punched way above its weight. And remember, you can build your own virtual garage on the Shannon's Club website. My name's Stephen Farmer and this is my 1977 Toyota Celica LT Fastback. I'm the third owner. Uh, the previous owner had it for 33 years and bought it when it was only a few years old off a friend of his. Since then I've literally had to do nothing to it. I've uh, changed some suspension bushes and done a service on it and that's the only thing it's needed. It was that well kept. My very first car was an 88 model Toyota Celica, so certainly not as sought after and desirable as this one is. Ever since then it was such a good car that I fell in love with Japanese cars and Toyotas in particular and just always had a bit of a passion for them. So the opportunity to own the, the car that started it all for the Toyota Celica range was uh, an opportunity I couldn't pass up. It's a Toyota 18RC, which is a two litre single cam, single carby engine. It's a little bit agricultural, certainly doesn't make a, a whole lot of power and torque, but uh, solid as an ox and it'll go forever and a day. The rear seat actually folds perfectly flat against the boot floor and uh, uh, I've uh, recently fit a full set of wheels and tyres in the back of the car, which uh, you'll struggle to do in most modern cars. The car is completely 100% original. There's not a single modification on the car. It's never been touched and uh, I intend to keep it exactly as is. I don't think I'll be letting go of this one anytime soon. I think it's, in, it's here for the long haul.
Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borabon, joins us to talk about Salikas. Welcome back, Hello. Mike. Hi, Chris. Chris, Toyota Salikas, they're it's such a mixed bag. The, mm. the early version is so desirable. The later one's got a little bit soft. And to throw in amongst all of that, the, there are twin cam engines going in the later models. Can you help us make sense of what's <laughs> going on in terms of values and what people are after? Oh, look, it's a, it's a real mixed bag. I mean, I really love the early Salikas. I grew up with those cars and... Um, Look, we're seeing a mixture of the 22, 23s, uh, either running original running gear or have had the modified twin cams in them. Does that make much difference to values? Look, to some it does, to others it doesn't. It, mm. It's quite an acceptable modification and I think a lot of people are looking for the extra power so they, they, they look forward to it. So is there a favourite Celica model? That's, oh yeah, it's a personal choice, that one. Yeah, Again, that I, must be pretty yeah, broad. Yeah. It is. I mean, I really love the early look of it, 22s and 23s, yeah, but yeah. there's also a great following for the, 20, uh, the RA28, the Mustang Fastback yeah. look. So, yeah. yeah, so I think they've got their own markets, yeah. Are they a practical classic in terms of uh, spare parts backup and things like that? We, we have seen a renewed interest in the early Selecas, mm. and I think uh, with the new Japanese JDM scene out there, as they call it, mm. that's... Uh, uh, really a renewed interest in it so we are seeing a lot of them out there so I think the people are now putting more uh, emphasis on the parts and uh, you know probably sourcing in parts and making sure that cars aren't going to a scrapyard and being safe for the parts. Oh, that's good. And Chris we're, we're seeing a trend too where uh, they're putting later style Supra wheels on early Salikas. Mm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Should they still be sticking to the period look? What, what's Personal preference uh, choices again. Uh, I would prefer to see uh, a period style alloy on uh, on those cars, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know we're seeing a combination of both. Yeah. And if we get coming towards the end, we know the middle generation with the the Californian styling. It's a very appealing car. But what about those last wedges that look like they're made out of a folded piece of paper and <laughs> they, they tended to rust and they tended to be a little bit heavy to drive? Yeah. What do you think is going to happen with those? We're going to have to try and find some. I, I haven't seen too many on the roads these days. Yeah, but look, I'm sure there are still some original ones out there. But as you mentioned, there, we had some problems with the rust on those. Um, we haven't seen a, you know, a huge market out there from at the moment. Mm. Well, thanks for joining us, Chris, to talk about Salikas. Keep in mind, you can keep up to date on all the latest Shannon's Auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. For a lasting memory of the Toyota Celica in competition, or indeed any of the other cars featured on the show, you'll find them all available in Autopic's incredible collection of over three quarters of a million motorsport images. Well, Joe, looking back at the Celica, you know, it had a number of firsts, but one of the things that really stands out for me is the amount of ownership loyalty that car created. It's interesting you say that because they engaged a wide spread yeah. of owners with the first one, and as those owners got older, mm. they changed the car to suit. And mm. you can see it. They, as, <laughs> it sort of got bigger. <laughs> uh, and, and, and sort of softer and a bit more yeah. remote. Mm. The downside to that strategy, though, was that Toyota no longer had an entry level to attract young drivers. Correct. And they yeah. had to resort to putting T18 badges on Corollas mm. and things like this to try and get the young buyers in. And I think they didn't really solve that until the MR2 and cars like that arrived. Mm. We hope you've enjoyed reliving the road and race history of the Toyota Celica and we'll catch you next time on Shannon's Club TV.